Shall we begin the next canto? Huh? Or you want to ask something? Okay. <laughs> This is a long canto. Yeah. It has, uh, you know, 972 lines. One of the longest cantos. 972 lines in one canto. Five sections, 245 sentences. <laughs> there are five sections now here. Yeah? 143 to 143, 44, 45, 46, 47. Five sections and total number of sentences is 245 and the total number of lines 972. So again, you see my theory is becoming perfect. Although there are long sentences, short sentences and all that thing, on average there are four lines per sentence <laughs> on average. You have got 972 lines, 245 sentences. So the average is 3.97 <laughs> per sentence line. 3.97. I sent you also the list of revisions uh, which are there uh, in this canto. You see. There are a couple of important revisions most of them are of the trivial kind but there are a couple of them which are uh, significant you see. but we'll not go much into those details you see yeah uh, i have a question about the revisions Pardon? revisions which happen in the ashram afterward do you think it's a betrayal which the revisions no you see the do you think it's so it is painful. Actually, what they should have done is there are differences, there are uh, certain ambiguities also, all those things we grant it. What they should have done is they should, they should have simply listed all the, uh, the versions which are available and compile the data and keep as it is instead of introducing them in the text here. That is the argument I have been making right from the beginning, since 1988. You see, I have been insisting upon that. Finally, I will prove. Yeah. <laughs> huh? No. I said, you see, all right, you have got a certain valid point, but that is not the way of doing You first list them out. And let each editor have his own choice to justify what is what is what is what not. You are not listening about, you are not giving the reasons why you are making changes. If the texts are available, different texts, then people will judge which is more appropriate for him. Yeah. yeah. Now you are blocking all that thing completely. So in that sense, uh, that is the wrong thing they have done. You see. And uh, had to fall apart and then all uh, those consequences. <laughs> That's all right here. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Well, actually, in a way, we could not but only publish the first edition because of copyright. <laughs> because of the copyright, we could publish only 1950-51 edition of Savitri. Copyright was there when it was when it elapsed. Then only it came out. Yeah, copyright. Now, you can also publish 1954 edition. Its copyright also has elapsed. Yeah, without any permission. You can publish now in 1954 also. See. But uh, it has no relevance, 1954. So, to go entirely by what had come out at the time of Shevendra himself, that is the basic text. And then you give all your data, this thing, that thing, etc., etc. You see, we are we are we are struggling for that. Let us have some access to the original text. No, 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 no. It should be open data, actually. Yeah, yeah. You you scan them and yeah. 
exactly. Yeah, yeah. and open. Uh, yeah, yeah. In the archives, make a, in the archives, make a room available and let people go and study there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, in fact, I mean, uh, uh, anybody will be able to uh, help you for scanning and all, whatever is required, whatever facilities are required. That is not a problem at all. Well, we'll have to wait for some more time <laughs> for that to happen. I had given a complete document in 1988 when we were meeting and discussing all that thing, how and archives should be organized completely. I had given the example of Niesbohr archives in Copenhagen. The way in which it organized, how people go there and study and read whatever manuscript you want, they are made available to you there, you see. I had given the complete plan of Copenhagen uh, archives of Niesbohr and said, this is how a modern archive is organized. Don't keep anything hidden, secret from you. So all the documents are there, papers are there, letters are there, these goals, letters are there. He had played a very crucial role during the time of World War II when the atom bomb was being developed by the Germans at that time. And it was he whose effort really promoted the entire effort in England, in, in uh, uh, US. Within one week, they carried out the experiment saw the feasibility of an atom bomb and they started building up the atomic pile. So Nish Bohr role in that process was very crucial. He was a person who was a respected scientist by everybody, by friends, by enemies, everybody. So he had friends in Germany, he had friends in Holland, he has friends in England, he had friends in uh, US, everywhere and uh, his words carried weight, you see. And all those papers are available in these four archives for study. So I said, look, this is how an archive is organized. But yeah. But my question is, for example, someone and only the last version of Sariqi. This is a problem for him because there are many distortions, many uh, changes. No. What do you think? What, what is your opinion? Uh, is this slavery version? I tell you one thing. I, I tell you one thing. For instance, as an example, uh, you take book one, half of Savitri. Sorry, part one. Part one. Part one. 24 cantos, half of Savitri. Now, that was practically written by Shevindu in his own handwriting mm -hmm. in 1944, completely, you see. But then it didn't stop with that. A fair copy of it was made by Nirodh Baran in his registers. That fair copy was read out to Shrevendo and in the fair copy he has made addition changes dictations. It was typed by Nalini. Type scripts were read out again to Shrevendo and again revision changes, additions, subtractions are there. You see in type school. It went at least three times through the press. Three times. It came out in the Ashram journals, Patmandir in Calcutta, Advent in uh, Ashram and all that thing. During Shiva time, 1946 to 1950, most of those parts have come out as fascicles and as cantos in different journals of the ashram during Sri Aurobindo time. So when they were sent to the press, again the press proofs were read out to Sri Aurobindo. He made changes, corrections, this thing, that thing, etc. Et Even at that point, you see, the last minute. And in 1950, when the full edition of part one was published, it was on 3rd September 1950, the book had come out in the physical form. Sri Aurobindo had seen it himself part one. You see. So again, it went through at least three or four stages of typing, sorry, uh, of printing and proofreading through him. And at every point, there were changes made. Now, in most of the cases, the proofs which were read out to Sri and in which the corrections were made, they don't exist. 
those proofs, proofs, proofs. <laughs> they don't exist. Proofs don't exist. They are not there. People, press people have the, the disability of this marriage. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. They are not, they, at that time they didn't realize the importance of that. No, there, there are there are number of important things in the proofs. See what is there, for instance, uh, in the last TypeScript, and what has come out from the print was only in between the proof. So if the changes are there, it means that the changes were made in the proof, and those proofs don't exist. They just don't exist now. So it is very difficult to say this scene. Shabadu are making constant changes every time they are seeing. Exactly. But you give the data for me. I will accept that. Don't touch the part, you see. If there is the dropping of a fly on part one, keep that dropping of the fly on it as it is. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, everything was sent. No, the, 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 the you see missing proof uh, is uh, the, the one one missing link. We can't help it there now. So the, I will say only that what is there. For instance, the TypeScript which must have gone to the press, that is there, and the difference between the TypeScript and the printed text which is there. It means that the change has taken place during the proof. But there are, there are relatively small uh, uh, instances of that kind. Although, I mean, in, in principle they exist, but they are not uh, too many of that type. In one case, when the proofs were sent to Shemendu, the uh, press asked him, should this comma be there or not? Some comma was there, so they asked a query to Shemendu whether the comma should be there or not. Shevendu took the opportunity of that and dictated 20 more lines. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? You see? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can see now, but it's there. Maybe I'm slightly exaggerating, but it's there. You see, it's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is just right. No Xerox, no photocopying, no computers. That is, it's all right. You see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it happened like that. So that is the unfortunate part. But anyway, I, I still feel the safest, the proper, the technical, scientific way is go by the 1950 as it is and give whatever data you have in a proper compiled manner. You see, there are, there are instances, that famous line, God's above and nature's soul below, Canto 2, oh, nature's soul below. Now, nature's apostrophe, S-O-U-L, so God's, the whole fight between Yama and Savitri is being seen, observed from God's above and nature's soul below. They are witnessing the fight between Yama and Savitri. That is the whole purpose. Now, they have made it nature, soul below. Instead of nature's soul. Nature, so hey, hearing mistake, something. <laughs> so, so they have made it in the revised edition, nature, soul below. Now, the argument is that this line appears in something like 24 drafts and everywhere it is nature, soul below, N-A-T-U-R-E, S-O-L-E, below, in all the drafts. But then when it comes to the Patmandir version, 
there is a change. And that missing link is not there. Shivan has made correction, there are changes there in that. There you find suddenly nature's soul below. So they say that, look, Shevandu, what we have in Shevandu handwriting 24 times is nature, soul. They are ignoring what has happened in the last proof stage, nature's soul below. So like that, so these, these details have to come out, you see. This is what uh, I have been uh, fighting for, struggling. Quickly read a couple of sentences <laughs> of the next canto. The narrative, a short narrative, just 16 sentences of the first section. There came a slope that slowly downward sang. It slipped towards a stumbling gray descent. Now it's describing the whole march, you see. The dim heart marvel of the ideal was lost. Its crowding wonder of bright, delicate dream and vague half limb sublimity she had left. Thoughts fell to a lower level, hard and ten, it passion for some crude reality. The twilight floated still, but changed its hues, and heavily swayed the less delightful dream. It settled in tired masses on the air, its symbol colors hewn a duller red. And all was seemed a lurid mist of day. His training taught and died besieged her heart. Heavy her sense grew with a dangerous low, and sadder, greater sounds were in her ears. And through stern breaking saw the lambent glare, her vision caught a hurry of driving plain, and cloudy mountain and white tawny stream. And cities climbed in minarets and towers towards an unveiling changeless sky. Long caves and carts and harbors, white with sail, challenged her sight a while and then were gone. So it is a kind of a natural scene she is describing further down now. I miss them, them, all these things. Travel, toiling multitudes. In ever shifting perishable groom, it foils cinema of lit shadowy shame, enveloped in the grave mantles of a dream. Imagining meanings in life's heavy drift, they trusted in the uncertain environment and waited for death to change their spirit's ascent. A savage din of labor and a tram of armored life and a monotonous hum of thoughts and acts that ever were the same, as if the dull reiterated drone of a great brute machine beset her soul, a gray dissatisfied rumor like a ghost of the morning of a loud and quiet sea. A huge inhuman cyclopean voice, a babble song, Towering to heaven, a throb of engines and a clang of tools brought the deep undertone of labor's pain. As when pale lightning stare a tortured sky, high overhead cloud rim series of flare, gazing like smoke from a red funnel driven, the post creations of an ignorant mind. Drifting, she saw like pictured fragments of flame. Phantoms of human thought and baffled home, the shapes of nature and the arts of man, the philosophies and disciples and disciplines and laws and the dead spirit of old society, constructions of the titan and the worm, as if lost remnants of forgotten light before a mind. They are played with trailing wing, dim revelations and delivering world, emptied of their mission and a strength to save. The messages of the revengeless gone, voices of prophets, scripts of vanishing creed. Each in his hour eternal claimed went by, ideals, systems, sciences, poems, crafts, tirelessly their perish 
and again Rickard sought restlessly with some creative power, but all were dreams crossing an empty wall. Ascetic voices called of lonely seer on mountain summits or on river bank or from the desolate heart of forest glade, seeking heaven's rest or the spirit's wordless being, or in bodies motionless like statues, fixed in transitions of the sleepless thought, sat slaving souls, and this too was a dream. All things the past has made and slain were there, its last forgotten form that one that lived, and all the present loves as new revealed, and all the hopes the future brings had failed, already caught and spent in a first veil, repeated fruitlessly age after age. Unwearied, all returned insisting still because of joy in the anguish of pursuit, and joy in labor, and to win and lose, and joy to create and keep, and joy to kill. The roaring cycles passed and came again, brought the same toys and the same barren end, forms ever new and ever old, appalling revolution to the world. The roaring cycles passed and came again. So that is how it keeps on repeating. We'll take it up again next time.